I was always interested in why fear is defeated by reason. How we genuinely believe that fear controls our emotional responses to things. And in order to overcome them, very often people just have to think differently. Like, if you change the way you think of things, uh -huh. the things you think of change, right? And this is how you say this, you see things. So my interest has always been how to control this emotional response to fear, which is so irrational. So the genuine way in which I think of it is that nothing is permanent, mm -hmm. and you have a genuine way to explain yourself, and if you know what it is that you're looking for, it changes your whole perspective. Okay. So I've lived in Hong Kong now for uh, almost 15 years, and I came initially here to work in a clinic I was interested in changing my life effectively, but what happened is that in order for me to change my life, I had to change my perspective. And that's why this whole journey came about by looking at ways in which to express myself. And of course, at the end of the day, creativity is the essence. That's what we did before we could speak, was to paint. So I spent my life now working on seven patients. I have seven or eight people. Each morning when I go do my Tai Chi, that's what I do. And I have the afternoon left for me to be able to do what I want to do, which is to paint. And I genuinely feel that you express your own emotional responses. Effectively, it's your own therapy painting. So I love the idea that by making a painting, it's a genuine thing that's a real expression of my own emotional response. And most of the time, painting is just you know a method. It's just a, a way to learn. It's like a technology. You, if you understand the rudiments, you can make a painting. But of course, the nuances or the way in which to put the genuine emotional issues, translate that into a, a painting, that is complex. And it's usually do with the eyes, I find. The eyes are a, a way, as they say, it's the soul of the body, right? And you look into the eyes, you can genuinely read how people think. So the art therapy things that I've been exploring is finding ways for you to genuinely understand the differences between emotional responses to anxiety, to fear, and the irrational way that we expect things to happen. For example, our emotional response to things is always we are creating irrational issues. And most of the time this irrational way of behaving is based on all sorts of assumptions. Like for example, why are we irrationally impatient? Because we fear that we're not in control. And in order to be in control of things, you need to change your perspective about things and not become obsessed with being in control. So Molo Singh is really an important thing because in Chinese Molo Singh means I'm in control of my own emotional responses but I'm also in charge and you are in my way so get out of the way so that I can be affected. <laughs> okay, so I'm now 78 so it means I don't have very many years left and that's why I genuinely, <laughs> I genuinely feel that's my karma, or my yuan fan, as we say in Chinese, is in order for me to fulfill my obligations, I have to genuinely do good for the remainder of my time here. And that's what I do. Each morning I go do my Tai Chi, and I work on my seven people. I come back and paint it. Look, what's better than that? Life, in a way, is the best of both worlds. And as they say, Kup Si Hong Wok. You know what they say? Kapsi Hong Wok. Kapsi Hong Wok. Yeah, another good, nice expression. The other one I learned, which is interesting in Chinese, is Mo Lei Gong Ho Hei. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> but everybody laughs when I say it, so there must be a reason for it to be funny. Does it mean anything? Is it Mo Lei Gong Ho Hei? Yeah. It means I count on you. Ah, that's it. Okay, yeah. that's the reason. So when I worked in the clinic here, people used to say, thank you so much. Uh, I'm paying the money, but I'm now out of here. And I said, can you say that in Chinese? They said, oh, Mole Gama Hoi. Where are you from, Lee? I've been uh, living abroad for so many years, but I was born in Africa, in Southern Africa, in 1945, 44, sorry. And uh, I spent pretty much until I was 25 there. Mm -hmm. So after I did my uh, military service, which were obliged to do, I was lucky. I was given an opportunity to go and live in Paris, or to study in Paris. And it came about, it came to talk coincidences, just because I have a French surname, mm -hmm. the people that had the grants which they issued to any Africans mm -hmm. were based on what it is that you potentially wanted to study, but most importantly, what your background was. Since I have a French background and they associate this with my ability to speak French, which I couldn't. So I went to <laughs> Paris uh, when I was 20, 1968, mm -hmm. which was very different from how it is now. You know, mm -hmm. people were very, 
open to any kind of <laughs> liaisons, as we say in French. And uh, it was a better time, in a sense, because people's fear of this unknown thing, you know, this sort of STDs and all these kind of situations were irrelevant, in a sense. People had a very different perspective of how... And French, of course, you know, the relationship French have is always, they are superior because we know they're better than everybody else, according to them. <laughs> and most of the people that were in the university were, you know, intellectuals. So I arrived there from the military with white hair mm -hmm. and very bronzed, and I thought, what am I doing here? But the good thing about it is, of course, the advantage you have is that you have uh, an ability to connect with almost anybody because you've been in the military. And the French were very isolated, but you had to learn to speak French, which is, of course, is the best way to learn French, is to have a relationship with a young woman. And those days you could. You could have... Uh, I was genuinely surprised to find that I could have a, a share a, a bed with two, two women and uh, then say goodbye. <laughs> you know, which is really interesting. The, the, the concept of being able to understand the human mind and how we think is to study something like philosophy. So I was very uh, greatly advantaged that I was able to study at the Sorbonne. And I was able to do a, a series of courses which involved not psychology, but philosophy. And uh, as I said, 1968 was a very different perspective on things. So what interested me was to really do research on how the mind works. And then I went from there. I was very fortunate to be able to go to Except America, which is a medical research facility in Amsterdam. And uh, lucky for me, that those days I was able to research the understanding, the concept of changing perspectives, which is effectively to do with that. And my interest was how to not make a living per se, but just how to genuinely study something. So I did uh, four years of psychology after philosophy, and then I started looking at choices of life and you know of course this stage you start to think of a family and getting married and all the things that are involved in that so I was very lucky in a sense because I was able to find a, a, a way to live my life by pursuing what I love to do and they say that very often let uh, what you love be what you do and most of the young people that I work with now really don't have many options they seem to limit themselves to thinking that your choices are so few that it's always about the negatives. And I think what is interesting for me is how to find credence for your life, you know, to do something worthwhile. I mean, how many people go to university and study things they're really not going to end up doing, like accountancy or whatever they do? I think you might as well take it, advantage of the situation. In this particular time, we have the greatest ability to use technology to our benefit and to study and do the things you really love to do and because you have the choice to do so, because most people lock themselves in believing. I mean, the interesting predominant thing at the moment is what do people really want? It's a hard question to answer, but people really seem to want to be happier. And I often think, well, happier than what? If you compare that to your grandparents, for example, we know we're happier in spite of the incredible advances in technology and medicine and everything. And you have genuinely, the crisis seems to be the internet is slow, that's the crisis. You know, or my dog is sick. I mean, it's, it seems to me people have no, they've not benefited from society at the moment. And yet this is the best ever time to live. And people will, may take issue with that, but I genuinely believe the opportunities are so wide that you can do almost anything you want to do. You, as long as you have a bed to sleep in and a pot noodle for the day, uh, that's basically great fortunes to be had. So we're no happier than our grandparents, in spite of all the technology, because we're not looking for happiness. People were surprised to know. We're actually looking for peace. Once you find peace, then you can find happiness. But to pursue happiness is like pursuing wealth, you know, it's like uh, two bald men fighting over a comb. There's no point. But happiness is just a transitory thing. You can be happy for 20 minutes. And I think most of the people confuse this thing, so they're always looking at the obstacle. It's in my way, therefore I can't get over it. Instead of thinking, you know, look for the long term, don't do the short term. A friend of mine is uh, in a relationship with a woman who says, she's completely crazy, she wants sex every day. I said, but aren't you lucky? And he said, it's driving me crazy. I mean, <laughs> I don't mind, but, uh, you know, genuinely too much effort. She's French, this woman. And I, I said to him, 
have you learned anything from your experience? He said, mostly French, you know, because you learn how to cook and how, how to speak French, which seems to be the thing. But at the end of the day, you know, we all pursue what we love. If you can have the choice to, that's my option. I think love what you do is the important thing. Well, I came to Hong Kong because I was working, uh, I had a clinic, I was running a clinic in London, and I decided after uh, so many years that all the trappings, fame and fortune, it didn't really make me happy. I, I had money and I had fame, etc. and so on. It wasn't really a thing that I was pursuing. I didn't really like it, but I didn't know it. So you end up with, you know, all the cars, the trappings, etc. and so on. And I came to Hong Kong because I have a very good old friend here who's been a friend of mine for years. And uh, I often remind him I knew him when he was poor, you know, it just makes a big difference. And uh, he's very nice in a way. He tends to think of his boat, as, his yacht as a boat, you know, he's just a very genuine guy. Anyway, I came to Hong Kong to visit him and I wanted to understand, uh, I wanted to pursue a different line of thinking as far as psychotherapy was concerned. So I went to study, I went to Japan for a few months and worked with a uh, uh, somebody there, but at the end of the day I was interested in the work that uh, Professor Emoto, which is called Water Talking, it's to do with molecules frozen, etc. and so on, and expressing emotions as a consequence. And then I came back to Hong Kong and I thought, well, where would I like to live if I had the choice, apart from being back in Europe? Um, and where do they speak English and where do I have friends? And this is how I ended up in Hong Kong. But I started working in a clinic opposite uh, Marks and Spencer's in, in uh, in Central. Marks and Spencer? Yeah, there's a, a building, Marks and Spencer, oh, across the road from there, there's a okay, you know, okay. medical building. So I worked there with, a, with this uh, clinic for some time, and I realized that I put my white coat on and my books were there. I was just back in London, I was just doing the same thing. So I needed just to change my perspective, and I thought, okay, I'll sell my art collection, which is how I made enough money to live for the next 10 years. And that was 10 years ago, so of course now <laughs> my money is not so full anymore. The well is empty and the tree doesn't seem to bear the golden apples anymore. So I ended up in Hong Kong because it's the most convenient place to live and yet the safest city. And I have to say, uh, I've been very grateful to be here for the last 15 years. Yeah, I'm actually seeing, well, most of the people I see are just voluntarily. I, I'm not seeing people for money. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing people uh, genuinely because I feel that by able to give my years of experience to them on a basis that's not non-payment, that's a better way to do things than to have a clinic situation where people come to see you. you know, it just changes the perspective. I like the idea of being able to work outside. I don't have to have a space I don't have to, I mean my equipment is very limited, I have three things in the bench mm -hmm. and I actually go each morning but I just essentially work with man. So I retrained because I was interested in older people, gerontology and senior people that have musculoskeletal problems, you know, limited issues with movement and so on. So I retrained to be able to do that and I do slight manipulations so most of the people I work on are stroke people, uh, hip joint pain, uh, shoulder issues lower back problems which is related to the neck usually and I manipulate what's called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is from the brain to the thing, it's one of the wandering nerves. And it's a very specific manipulation where the muscle responds like a bit like kinesiology, you know, it has a genuine point in which I think. But, so most of the people that I see are really just old people, they're too young people, but effectively I prefer to go to the Sudhyasen and work outside near the seaside and that's what my small my Very rarely do I see people other than that and I did want to. I mean, I, I genuinely at this stage of my life do not want to do things for money, mm -hmm. although I'm not adverse to selling my paintings mm -hmm. so that I can raise money in mm -hmm. order to do what I'm doing now because uh, of course one has to pay a rent and you have to pay all the bits and pieces that are involved in that. But uh, two years ago I did a, a series of programs which is called psychotherapy for calming the mind and I use methods like art therapy work and one of the things that I, uh, I worked on was we found objects and children who have issues, genuine sort of anxiety issues and we made things like this for example and uh, what I liked was the fact that they found things that are worthless and they say it's only worth it if you if they're worth it to you so we made little sculptures and so on and I found a lot of the time with the children who have these issues 
were genuinely more at peace <coughs> once I had gone through the process of helping them make noise. So art as therapy is an interesting concept because you know people often think, well, you paint and you feel better. But there's much more to explore because we are, as human beings, we are incredibly complex. But we are locked into that little box, which is, you know, I must please others. I must belong. You know, but fashion is a very interesting issue. And how people feel very bad about not being fashionable. And then you say, well, okay, why do you have to be part? That's why graffiti is like dogs peeing, you know, they make them up. And they go, well, why are you doing this? Is it really essential? People haven't really thought this through. They don't think too much about um, who am I gender, who am I? They want to know who do I portray, who am I emulating, who am I looking like to be. That's why people are so easy to buy. Uh, I mean, you buy trainers for 5,000 in Hong Kong, why? Well, this is ridiculous. They're just made by some factory. But if people say, well, they're limited edition. This is why, coming back to the paintings that I make, I like the idea that they are a single, one-off painting made by me and oil. There are no others. There's just that simple one-off. So, of course, people say, well, I can buy a reproduction from Ikea or whatever it is. Well, that's fine, but that's not what you buy. You're not buying art. You're buying a reproduction of an artist. With my stuff, there are things that I make. They are made by me, <laughs> and there are no others. That's it. Well, people, I have a very cynical friend who's a doctor here as well. I used to work with him. He said, art, good art is expensive. I said, what does it mean? He said, well, people pay a lot of money, they feel better, and therefore, the art that they buy is good. I said, well, that's ridiculous. It's bullshit. I mean, if you think about it logically, um, there's a very famous uh, psychological analysis of a situation where they said, well, you can take... Um, Anybody with a mediocre talent, as long as you spend enough money, you can make them famous and they'll sell a lot of stuff. But the theory is you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. You know what I mean? You cannot change the perception of it. So genuinely, people buy art because they confuse two things. They think, well, art is an investment, and an investment is something I can make money from. So you can sell, and people do. You can sell a, you know, there's a famous, artist in 1938 called Manzoni who put his shit in a can. He sealed his, his shit into a can and he said this is an indictment of the stupidity of people who buy art. And the joke was 150 years later, whatever, 150 years later at Sotheby's, a very famous uh, auction house, they actually sold his shit in a can for a lot of money. And you know, there's a guy called Banksy, I don't know if you've heard of Banksy, which is interesting because Banksy, my daughter, works with him. And um, he, one of his paintings that he made, somebody bought, and he had inbuilt into the box a thing that stripped the thing, you know, like when, when you when you strip your letters or whatever, you, what do they call those things? When you, when you uh, recycle all the bits, they cut them into ribbons. What's it called? Whatever it is. Uh, and he put his painting had a frame and inside the frame was this thing and when somebody bought it for 20 million dollars they said 20 million dollars so and then it he activated somebody activated a switch and it's cut this thing into ribbons and destroyed it oh right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The graffiti thing. yeah. yeah. and in fact if you think about it the graffiti things now are incredible i mean they're things that people have made i have one somebody gave me japanese guy with me and oh i have it here and he said to me uh in 10 years time or whatever, I mean it's just a little drawing he gave to me and he gave this to me and he said 10 years time it will be worth money and recently, in fact when I was in London, at auction was this, this I have it here, it's a painting there and it was worth uh, 30,000 Hong Kong dollars and I just, you know, it's just a piece of paper. See, so you say to yourself, you know, what, what is, is it worth any money? Well, I don't know, if it depends on who sees what it is, you know, that's why we buy things that are fashionable, right? I mean, if you, if you see a, uh, uh, genuinely, why do people buy status? You know, they buy status because, you know, they think they'll feel better because they belong to a, a group of people. Hermes or Gucci, or as we say, they're going to come to bang, you know, the kind of theory of the Hong Kong princess yeah. must have the Gucci. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who says it's good? You know, uh, in the paradox of choice is a very interesting phenomenon. How do you decide on what to buy? I mean, a camera is made by somebody, right? Yeah. And you know it's the quality and so on. So that has a price, but all of all, the 3,000 of them in the supermarket, which one? Pot noodle, which is the, you know, what do you go by, price?
color, bottle. Like so the bottle. paradox of choice is there's too much choice. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to limit it. And life, the sense, in a sense, has exactly the same problem. We have too much choice, so therefore we think, oh, life is so hard, you know, I don't quite know what to do, things are so difficult. And of course, everything's to blame, as they say, the woke thing, you know. I don't, don't, uh, uh, I, I'm offended by words. I remember working with a woman who had a, a genuine problem for a very long time, and she said she'd gone to see so many people, and when she came to see me, she said, uh, uh, you know, I suffer from depression. And when I said, how do you know? She described anxiety, and anxiety is not depression. There's something completely different. So I said to her, what you need to do is you have to define depression, Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what you think it is, and then next week when you come back, I'll tell you whether you're right or wrong. And she defined anxiety. Now, we can treat anxiety with all sorts of, it's called cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. We can change the perspective that people have about the thing. But for years that she suffered from anxiety, she manifested all the traits of anxiety. Couldn't get out of bed, was always tired. When I changed it to her, I said, well, you have anxiety, it's treatable. Instantly it was resolved. I remember another woman came to see me and she said, I think I told you that she was 20, 32 maybe, and she was getting married, and she had uh, never had any kind of relationship with anybody. So she said, uh, I have an issue because I've been abused, I was abused as a child, and I'm getting married and I have issues I need to resolve because I won't be able to have a relationship with my husband if I do, yeah, unless I resolve it. And I said to her, okay, who was the abuser? And uh, how old were you when the abuser left? He said, my father, and I was one. Now the obvious question is, she couldn't have been abused by him if she knew it, because you don't know that at once. She must have been told, but she was told by her mother. So using the word abuse in the wrong way is not quite what this situation is about. If you say, I abuse you by shouting, scolding is a good Chinese word they use at the day. It's not abusing. So she had the impression that she was sexually abused, and in fact, she was just shouted at. So immediately, the words changed, the whole vision, the whole perspective changed, and overnight she's resolved the problem. Chinese whisper. Just like that, you see? And you think, well, so we attach too much value to rational things, and it's not what you own, it's what owns you, you know? And this is one of the reasons why I'm no longer interested in accumulating. I, I, want, I have things which are only valuable, uh, which are of no real value. You know, iPhone is a good example, it's your most valuable thing, right? But in the desert, it's worth a glass of water. <laughs> so, sorry. Do you consider yourself to be an artist or...? Uh, well, I'd like to think of myself predominantly, say, what is your legacy? I'd like to say, I have done some interesting paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, whether in my books or the stuff I've read or the things I've written, uh, I'm proud of, but I'm proud of my children and I'm proud of my paintings. So those are the things. And of course, genuinely, if somebody would be interested, and I know this will happen when I'm no longer here, when people will buy my paintings for the right reason and spend money that I can use the money to further the cause that I'm doing. I'm working at the moment on a thing called prosopagnosia. It's very complicated. The mind changes your perspective. If you have a lot of fear, it impairs the way that we think of things and translate because we look at the eyes. And we this the prosopagnosia is when you no longer recognize faces. And people get older, they start having issues. Now it's very debilitating. You see your your brother, your sister, or your husband, and you cannot recognize them. And I'm I'm interested to find methods to help people. You know, there's seven ways you can listen to the voice, mm -hmm. intonation, actions, mm -hmm. shape of the ears, and all these things. The things that we have in common are the irises of the eyes, the thumbprints, and the gait, the way you walk. So I wanted the way to you write. Walk. Yeah, your gait. You, 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 you're absolutely unique. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and yeah, nobody has the same walk. It's, uh, and so, of course, what people say is, so I want to write a program, mm -hmm. as I do with all the patients or all the people that I see, to write a program to help people with this particular condition to learn how to recognize people that they are lo in love with. Of course, it's a terrible thing. Can you imagine going home to Carmen and saying, oh, you look like somebody, but I'm not sure if it's you. you. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> you know, what are you in yoga? Oh, okay. I love you. <laughs> So the other one I'm, I'm particularly interested in is, you know, the, the new book I'm working on. We don't have a good word for that in, in, in our language, uh -huh. and you don't have a word in English. I mean, English is not my first language, but the, the word is aloneness. Aloneness. 
Now, loneliness and aloneness are two different things. Mm -hmm. So, effectively, being alone is considered in society a terrible thing. Oh, the person's alone. Mm -hmm. But I think, in a way, solace mm -hmm. and aloneness is a fantastic thing if you can cope with it. Mm -hmm. But we've been conditioned to think that we must, there must be noise all the time, mm -hmm. we must be in touch with people, that we must be in contact, we must, you know, whatever. And in fact, it's almost a substitute for living a better life. A lot of people say, a philosopher, I had this long discussion with a friend of mine, who's called Kant, is a philosopher, and he said abstinence, which is celibacy, not to have sex, mm -hmm. is a fantastic thing for a year. And so very hard to just like some not speaking. So of course everything is relative, but it depends on your perspective and also your evaluation of the issue. So for example, if somebody says, um, I have a terrible thing because I had a bad thing as a child, I have remorse and guilt, mm -hmm. your assumption is they must have done something terrible, like instead of spin, uh, stealing an ice cream from 7-Eleven. It's not a big deal, but it depends on your perspective, right? right? And you know, we can measure, we can measure height, weight, length, time, mm -hmm. But emotions are very hard. So very often when people come to see me about something, their issue should not be taken very lightheartedly. So they say, you know, when I was a kid I shot a pellet gun, you know, those air guns, mm -hmm. trying to hit thing, and I shot through a window and I might have killed. So the legacy that they've had for 20 years is this kind of thing, I might have killed somebody. Well, not with an air gun through a window at a distance, can't be. So you have to be objective about the situation. But people want they call it the crutch in psychology. They want to have an issue. There must be an issue. You know, this you is why issue uh, of course, they have to have an issue. And you can help solve one, they immediately go and find another. Because we need this constant need to, we almost justify the, the, the reason, if we don't have a, a worry, we create a worry. We need a reason. Well, suicide is something different, but, you know, people I work with, 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 um, with suicide people I work with, uh, I always have the same question to them, and I've learned to do this here in Hong Kong. But, you know, I do the park, I go to the park on Sunday, and I, so the suicide thing is not called the suicide bench, but I just call it the friendship bench. So people come and now they learn, of course, that they come to speak to me, and so th psychotherapy is just talk therapy. So the first thing I learn is people say, look, I've come to see you because I have suicidal tendencies. That's different from saying I want to commit suicide, two different questions. If you say I want to commit suicide, I usually say, oh, what method have you chosen? I say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, do you want to cut or jump or, you know, which is it that you mean? And I realize that these people are using suicide as a kind of metaphor. It's not really a genuine thing. Whereas if you say, I have suicidal tendencies, that is very often a situation where people say, I have some issues which I need to resolve, and as a consequence of not being able to resolve them, I need to find ways in which to, to commit suicide. Now you think, well, okay, um, give me an example of what it is that bothers you most. And from our point of view, that's very trivial. You know, my mother's not been very well uh, because my father's lost his job. And my brother is not working and he stays in his room playing video games and uh, I'm worried because we don't have any money. And, okay, is that realistic? How far can you go? But of course, all the issues that she's taking, she's taking it on herself. You know, in Japan, there's a, I wrote the whole series of articles on this particular thing. Uh, called, it's called hikikimori. Hikikimori is when people say, well, I, I have done my bad, genuine best, I've gone to school, I've paid society's dues. I've gone to school, I've gone to university, I've gone to take a job. It's not really for me, I don't want to do it, it stresses me out. I think therefore I have a choice to do the things I want to do. So therefore I'm going to put myself in my room and play video games and maybe leave for five years. And it's called Ikikimori. And there's a very genuine thing in Hong Kong is also happening. So what's interesting is that with this kind of situation, you are taking away your genuine ability to kind of compete with the other people. You've accepted that you're no good, so therefore your own self-esteem suffers. But of course, somebody has to feed you, right? So somebody has to, so they usually have a mother. And they often say, you know, bad love, good love, two different things. And I know that for myself, my children learn to, to sleep outside in the tent, make a fire, cut uh, a twig, fire a weapon, 
and cut a chicken up or whatever it is before they were 10. And people say, oh my God, that's absolutely crazy and outrageous. But the fact of the matter is, you learn certain principles in life, like learning to swim, for example, is very good. And I found that people who have suicidal tendencies, very often, it's a bad analogy, but can't swim. I said, if you really want to change your life, you want to do something with your life before you commit suicide, learn to swim. <laughs> people learn to swim and say, well, my life is changed. Now, you know, this interesting thing about, uh, we don't have a word in, the language that I learned as a kid is called Shona and then Afrikaans. I didn't speak English until I was 12. But we had a thing in Zimbabwe, which they don't have a word for depression. So when people come and see a psychiatrist or somebody who's, you know, somebody like me, they say, I've come to see you because I have depression. In Shona, this word is not, doesn't exist. So they have to explain. Well, I, I don't feel very well, things are out of control, etc. And so on. I'm very worried about things, whatever. In the West, people say, I have suffered from depression. There people say, oh, Kufun Gisisa. Kufun Gisisa means uh, you're thinking too much, too much thinking. You're thinking, overthinking the trouble. So people say, well, what I suggest you do is not think so much about that, but think of other things, and then come back on next week and tell me. And people come back and say, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that. I'm, my corn is not growing very well. So you solve the problem by changing the perspective of the world, see? So most of the people here in the West, when I was working now in London, I was working in a clinic in which people came, which were sponsored by the government. It's like a food, national health center. And people would come and then first thing they'd say is, oh, it's, it's a pain coming because I had to catch a bus and you know, I had to think, all the negative things and my life and whatever. And I remember one woman came to see me, she said, it's horrible being a refugee in London. And I think it would be nice for her to say, I'm so grateful to be a refugee in London, I'm able to get access to a house, or I might come from, you know, wherever I go. But people immediately think, and they say one word, which I really dislike, but they use this word a lot, they say, I'm entitled. Entitled. Yeah, I'm entitled to this, and I'm entitled to that, and I have a bad house, and I have a this, and I have a that. Why can't I have more? So this kind of uh, perspective has changed our whole valuation of what's genuine. So that's why I say to you, does art, which is expensive, valuable, uh, and does it genuine? I have no idea, probably, but it depends on your criteria. If you're in the desert, and your choice between your iPhone, mm -hmm. And you have uh, your cigarette packet for the for the they haven't smoked for two. You got it's a big choice to make. So often, the genuine ways in which to uh, to to pose a question to people is the hardest thing of all. Victor, it's the hardest thing to ask. And I often say to people, so people come and say, well, I work for Goldman Sachs and uh, I earn a Ferrari, whatever. And I said, okay, you've come to see me to tell me that. No, I've come to see you because I'm not feeling. Uh, it's, I'm not feeling. Okay, so now here's the question. What do you want? And people always look up. Uh, well, I, I want to be happier. Well, happier than who says you're not happy? Happier than what? Uh, well, I said. So we don't. You don't really want happiness. You want peace. If you find peace, you find happiness. And people are genuinely attaching all sorts of ideological issues. I, I have a, another friend who's in a relationship with it. He's an accountant. This guy. He's a very interesting guy. Forty-two years. He's here. Has a PhD. He's a clever guy. But he's always looking for ways to get rejected. So he'd go to one shy and say to the mama son, I'm looking for a beautiful woman who just landed yesterday. Of course, it's never the case. They've been here for five years. I'm looking for a genuine relationship. You know, oh, that'll be $500. And he ends up with the worst kind of woman who abuses him, steal from him. And then he comes and tells me, sir, I really don't understand. I said, look, you know, don't do that. And he said, oh, oh OK. Then he goes and does it again. It's all this fixation about his fear as a child of being exposed to things. His mother had this too much overbearing love. Don't, careful, please, to be a, what, do you know, the, and I often say to my friends here, don't wash your kids too much. Don't clean too much. Don't put all the shit in your food and then all that. It's not clean food, you know, washing tent doesn't matter. Thing. Give them a little bit of bacteria. Mm. And you know the gut mind bacteria thing mm. that's interesting, the mind, mind, and the mind and stomach issues. I think if you have a good gut, genuinely good uh, metabolism. You don't have uh, pylori or the, the bacteria that are involved in making you ill. You can live a better life and not stress them because I really do believe that at night when you're digesting your food, this correlates with mind thoughts. 
And often people, the eating bad things dream, right? Mm -hmm. And they all dream about the worst things. I, I have a, a, a friend who's united as a kind of safe way to nothing. I was working in Singapore in this, in this place. And the woman said, all the people that are working here have the opportunity to go and learn kinesiology, whatever you want to do, any course you want to do. But it has to be in Hong Kong and it's paid for by the government. I mean, in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, fine. I, nothing genuinely I want to know. And she said, you'll be fantastic at hypnosis. I said, well, hypnosis? What's that? And she, so I went to for, I became a master hypnotist and I could instantly induce sleep in people. And I thought, well, this is overreaction to sleep because I could not understand. Were they genuinely under hypnosis? Because they just pretended. It can't be true. <laughs> the people were doing crazy things. So I would use an, what's called an induction technique. Anyway, I went back to work at the clinic and the woman said to me, uh, so have you learned much about this particular technique? And I said, I became a master hypnotist in two and a half weeks. And she said, well, prove it. And I said, well, uh, I'd like you to take a deep breath and think of the place that you were born at. And then your greatest treat was going to the seaside. And as you went to the seaside with your parents, there was nobody there. It's a beautiful white beach and you could take all your clothes off. And the sea was just making a beautiful soft sound. And the palm trees were waving. There's nobody around and you were completely feeling completely and utterly, completely relaxed. <laughs> she was fast asleep. Her name was Vivian. I said, Vivian, 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 wake up. Okay. I was more shocked than that. And she was genuinely fast asleep, induced by this thing. And I tried it a few times. Sometimes I have people who have you know, breast cancer or something. So, so in order to take the, the, the stigma or the trauma away, I use this technique, this relaxation technique. Because effectively, it's not the illness, it's the fear of the illness. So people say, you know, uh, you go to a hospital to have a checkup about, I don't know, uh, it's a good example of uh, cholesterol, let's say. And they do a blood pressure test and they say, oh, sorry, your blood pressure is very high, it's 150 or whatever it is. Your immediate reaction is the stress involved in what will happen in the event of, because, you know, you can have stroke, etc. and so on. So people put themselves immediately to a different mindset about worry. And worry is a crazy situation. I don't have an issue, but you know, you don't walk through a... You do your, your yoga in the morning and it's still dark, five o'clock, right? And you're walking along. Okay, let's say you're in the evening, you're walking along in the park and it's dark and it's rather beautiful. But something touches your leg. You don't think it's just a tweak. The overreaction, you think. Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting how the mind works. So a lot of the time when I work with people, I try to say, okay, fine, let's get to a common ground. So because we can't ascertain your issue, because it's about fear and anxiety, how can we change that? So by changing the way you look at things, the things you look at change, right? So you can imagine having gone to Egypt, never having been there. So we have, as humans, this extraordinary ability to reason. So if you can reason for something which is extremely bad for you, surely you can therefore reason for something that's very good for you. If you can ascertain the difference and get to a balance, I'm particularly interested in the work of a guy, his name is Joseph Volpe, and he was a psychiatrist who worked in New York, so a South African guy. And he discovered, uh, in fact I wrote a whole story about the boy who learned to, the boy who learned to fear. He learned how to cope with fear, and basically what happened is as a kid you don't have any fears, right? I mean, as a baby, you just do. And what they did is they put a snake next to him and banged pots together. So the kid looked at the snake and the association of the pots and the sound made him fearful. And Joseph Volpe used that technique, but to reverse it, to say, okay, if you have a genuine fear of snakes, for example, we're going to expose you to snakes, but in a very limited way. First a rubber snake, then slowly a so and then other people play with the snakes and so on. So by, it's called desensitization, by changing your perspective about your fear, the fear itself changes. And that's why we have what's called the two-year rule. And uh, unless you have a situation which is called Velcro, where people attach themselves too much, the attachment is like the Stockholm Syndrome, where people are so fearful of the situation that happens, that instead of fighting the people who are kidnapping them, they start falling in love with them. 
they, 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 they can. So what happens in this situation where somebody says, well, um, the two-year rule, and I've said this to people a hundred times, if you have something to offer, offer it on the basis of an exchange, but not on a control situation. So I'm going to give you, at, uh, let's say, for example, I'm 50, and I meet somebody who's a really beautiful woman, and she's 23 or 25, I'm going to give you my experience in return for something that you're going to give me, but it's a two-year rule. After two years, we part and go and do other things, but people are not. It's like looking at life that you're going to live for 150 or 300 years. There's no such thing. And the reason why we gather so much stuff, furniture, books, etc., it gives you the kind of feeling that you're going to live a stability for life. Whereas if you have minimalism, which is another guy that I work with, if you have nothing, you have an apartment with a, so, with a futon. Interesting. So if you have a futon and uh, a bench and uh, two books, and uh, that's it. <laughs> you have a good life. So sometimes the simplicity of life. And you know, uh, having enough. You know, in French, enough is an egg, right? So they call it the egg theory. The egg theory is as if you know when you have enough, and that's difficult. When do you know? And finding things that are that have no value, but are valuable to you, doesn't have the same stability as being stolen. So if you have a watch that's cheap and only tells the time, rather than a watch that comes from your grandfather who still tells the time, losing those are, makes a difference. And you see, this is why it's irrational for, for you to be the taxi driver, if you can have a discussion with him, with a Moloi Singh thing, said, well, why are you so impatient? They're associating business with busyness. I'm so busy, so therefore my business will suffer, and I'm in control, and therefore I'm rushing. If you have the same, like, a taxi driver go from um, Kennedy Town to uh, Taiwan, let's say, mm -hmm. and the guy drives like crazy, mm -hmm. and the other guy's very, formed, uh, very relaxed, mm -hmm. they arrive at the same time. You know why? Because they, the, 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 the computer has set the traffic lights at the setting, so you know. So why would you crazy drive? But people cannot understand that. So you see, you have to then deal with that. And at the end of the day, my personal opinion was that it wasn't worth having the Ferrari and uh, all that stuff. It was not worth the effort. Mm -hmm. And it took me quite a long time to say, okay, what genuinely do you want? So what I genuinely want is to share what I know in a very calm, quiet way, treat people who don't give a shit to what I know or my, my qualifications or all those things, because it's only a piece of paper you know, your PhD or whatever, it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> just, just, and you know, your white coat. I mean, a, a, a white coat doesn't make a good doctor. It's just a well, coat. That's made you yeah. a well, who says, if you go to the butcher and you say, can I have a bunch of bananas? He said, are you crazy? It's next door. So you always go to the doctors or the psychiatrist or the therapist, whatever, thinking they must, they don't know. Academia, talking as a person who's 78 years of age, should come with a health warning. It's bullshit. I mean, you look at the people with, you know, walls full of uh, documents and genuine, you know, they know, and I know this from experience, they know nothing. If you ask a question, simple question, they have to look it up on Google. They really do not know. So you ask, you know, what is the point of having all this education? So for me, I always think, well, <clears throat> if I can teach you what I know, in a very basic, you don't get a certificate of white coat, <laughs> in a very basic way, and you go and help other people through very simple psychotherapy, just talk therapy, very simple, and that changes somebody's life. That is my karma, that's my fate, that's my MIS. That's it.